car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the law firm of Hollis Wright and host David Lamb. Good evening and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday evening. We have a panel of experts ready to deal with the topic of adoption and surrogacy and would love to have you be a part of the conversation. We try to make that easy for you. You see the information there on the screen all throughout the program for you to contact us. Also a reminder, attorneys from the firm Hollis Wright standing by right now to take your call. So for the next half hour, a great opportunity to get some great free legal advice. Leading our conversation tonight from the firm of Hollis Wright, Josh Wright, good to see you, sir. Great to see you too, hope you're doing well. Doing well. Did you have a good week? It was a good week. Good. You? Uh, excellent week, and you, you knocked the intro out of the park, as usual. <laughs> Did though. I? You do such a good I job. I try to bring it. Hey, speaking of knocking out of the park, Kayla Schoen, Kayla. who, by the way, runs a firm here in town called The Schoen Firm, used to be with our firm when she was in law school as a clerk. Right. And now she's knocking it out of the park on her own, doing all sorts of really great stuff. Super excited to have you on the show, Thank and you. I know you've been on before. Yes. We're going to be talking about a totally different topic, that's something right. that's kind of near and dear to your house on the uh, probate side. We're going to be talking about adoption, surrogacy, foster care, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Kayla's got an established practice in that area. And when you're in need of legal assistance in this area, uh, or if you just need general advice on this area, Kayla's a great uh, resource for this. Thank you. So, question I guess anybody would have when they talk to somebody that does this type of legal work, how do you get involved in this? Because I know you've been on the show because you have an expertise in bankruptcy and do some bankruptcy work. Right. How do you go from bankruptcy and then compartmentalize and go over this? Because this is a, such a neat area of the law. Well, when you're a solo practitioner, you do a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's natural. Um, but the bulk of my work is probate work. And here in Jefferson County, the probate court handles um, adoptions. So it's sort of a natural fit for me. And so you have, you have not only gotten into adoptions, but also into foster care, that type of legal work, as well as surrogacy, which is a whole new area. In fact, I know you and I talked beforehand, and Dave and I did too, kind of getting prepared for the show. I didn't even realize the legal implications in law associated with surrogacy. So I'm kind of excited to be able to talk about that tonight. Yeah, there's a lot involved. Um, and like you said, it's very near and dear to my heart. I, um, it was one of my favorite things to do when I clerked to the probate court was to um, see the final adoption hearings. They're always, you know, just so nice and emotional and everybody's there taking pictures and um, so it, it's a fun thing to handle. Well, it makes you smile to be a lawyer to get involved yeah. in this kind of stuff. Well, that's yeah. good because that, not, not every area of the law is that way. So, yeah. uh, all right, let's, let's talk about this. Um, adoption, um, th there is a significant legal component to adoption, is there not? There is. All right, and is adoption something that you can work through on your own, do you advise you need to have a lawyer to be able to kind of lead, guide, and direct you through the process? Give me kind of your thought on that. So the initial process of adoption, most people will go through an adoption agency. Um, and so the bulk, you know, the front end work is done through them. And then at the very end, you'll need an adoption attorney to draft um, documents for you to finalize the adoption and you'll go to the final hearing where everything will be legally settled the adoptive parents will become the legal parents birth certificates will be changed um, so you will need an adoption attorney on the back end and is is it and i've, I've got some friends that have adopted um, and there's always a fear i think in the back of the mind of an adoptive parent that there is some legal right that a mother or father could come to try and get custody of the child down the road. H how do you explain that to clients? Because I know that's got to be a question you get a lot. Yeah, and it happens, and it happens often. Um, in traditional adoption, um, the birth mother has to sign off um, and execute consent um, in order for it to be finalized, and she can change her mind. In Alabama, I believe it's up to 10 days after the birth. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. And sometimes they do change their minds. And that can be really heartbreaking for a family that has been waiting on this child um, for a very, very long time. But it does happen. 
What do you see in your practice most often? Is it adoptions through adoption agencies that are dealing with foreign countries or is it U.S. Uh, kind of domestic adoptions. What do you see the most uh, that comes to Alabama? It's a good mix. Um, I actually went to a seminar recently hosted by our probate judges here, Judge King and Judge Friday, and they said that adoptions were on the rise, and in particular, uh, foster parent adoptions were on the rise, um, and even young couples who were choosing to foster children and then ultimately adopt them. So it's a good mix. There's a lot of domestic adoption, um, but there's still a good bit of foreign adoption. It's just a little bit more difficult because you're having to deal with um, you know, foreign countries and their requirements and that sort of thing. Got a question here about the difference in cost uh, in terms of adoption versus surrogacy. Sure, so adoption is going to cost around, and this is an estimate, it will vary, um, I would say twenty to $25,000. Um, you're going to have adoption agency fees, um, you know, travel expenses, just a lot of um, attorney's fees and that sort of thing. Um, but surrogacy, you're going to get a little bit more certainty, but you're going to pay for it. Surrogacy can also vary wildly, and I've seen uh, fees anywhere from $40,000 up to $140,000. Because um, you're talking about surrogacy agency fees, um, the attorney's fees to draft legal documents, which are done prior to the embryo um, mm -hmm. transplantation process. And, you know, oftentimes, or most of the time, the adoptive parents will be paying for the expenses for the surrogate as far as hospital bills and transportation and, um, you know, really just anything that they need. So it can get really expensive, but you have more certainty. How are um, children that are being adopted, whether it's through a, a foreign agency, a domestic agency, um, is there a screening process used during adoption where the parent has some ability to monitor or to influence um, uh, race, sex, um, uh, background related to medical conditions, those types of things. I mean, is that a, not that once it's your child that you would change anything you would do, right. but is there some influence that the parent has in that process? A little bit. Um, with adoption, traditionally, you'll approach the adoption agency and you'll have an idea of if you want to do domestic or foreign, um, you know, maybe gender, you might have a preference, maybe medical history or or race, like you said, um, but ultimately it will be up to the birth mother to decide who she wants to hand over her child to. Um, with surrogacy, you know, it's a little bit uh, more certain. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of, oh, we're about to go to break, yeah. okay. When we get back, I All do right. want to talk about this because I, I've heard of these stories um, and it's terrible that people would use this at a, a mother and father's worst moment, um, but the fraud associated with the adoption process. I'm sure there's some things that you've probably seen and that we've all heard of. Mm -hmm. Just want to see how you can kind of prevent those things moving forward. Talk about that when we come back. We'll do that. Stepping aside for our first break of the evening as we do so, a reminder of how you can get in touch with us. We'd love to have your input. Also, if you uh, follow folks on Facebook as well as Twitter, uh, Hollis Wright is there as well. Just search the term Hollis Wright. You'll find them on Facebook, on Twitter. It is Hollis underscore Wright. Stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm. Thank you for watching The Attorneys. Now we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury related topics, you can call, email, or text us. Or you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or simply contact us by going to hollis-right.com and click on the contact us link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us watching The Attorneys.
adoption and surrogacy, the topic of conversation tonight. Appreciate you being with us here on the attorneys. A reminder, live attorneys standing by right now to take your call. Just pick up the phone and give them a call. Also, as you can see, the information on your screen for you to partake of our conversation and get involved yourself. Josh. All right, so Kayla, when we left, we were talking about um, protecting yourself against fraud associated in the adoptive procedure, whether it's through a foreign country, whether it's through a United States country, or, you, you know, kind of a United States agency. T tell us, how, how do you protect yourself in those circumstances? I would say just do your research. Make sure that you go with a reputable company, um, you know, as far as an adoption agency or a surrogacy agency. Um, they're also going to have good recommendations as far as adoption or surrogacy attorneys to use. So, um, you know, do your research. Talk to friends, family who have adopted. Talk to people in your church who have adopted. Um, and, you know, take your time and find a right agency and attorney um, that work for you. Yeah, so important because obviously you don't want to be at that kind of emotional moment in the relationship of a husband and wife that are trying to adopt and have a really bad experience with it. So doing your research and making sure that you've vetted the company that you're going to be using is super important. And it sounds to me, from what Kayla's saying, a lot of it is probably talk with people that have been through this before. Right. Yeah, you certainly save yourself a lot of heartache, mm -hmm. I bet. Uh, a couple of questions we, we've got here. What's the major difference between traditional surrogacy and gestational surrogacy? Okay, so gestational surrogacy would be where um, you would take your husband's sperm and your egg um, and they would be implanted into a separate woman to carry the child. Um, and that is more expensive because you're dealing with costs involved with um, the impregnation and also the birth of the child. Whereas traditional surrogacy is something along the lines of if you went to a fertility clinic and you had you know, a sperm donor or an embryo donation and, and you as the adopted mother would carry um, the child. Mm -hmm. What are the legal rights then? All right, so this sounds similar to adoption, but I know it's a different area of the law. What are the legal rights to the surrogate at the time of birth, whether it's gestational or otherwise, to be able to change their mind and say, look, I, th I want to maintain this child as mine. I assume that happens and that's got to be a legal mess. Well, it doesn't because with surrogacy, like I said, you're paying more, but you're getting more certainty. So if you did gestational surrogacy, you would know the surrogate and the documents would be drafted ahead of time. So as soon as the embryo is implanted, you are the legal parents. It's, they have no rights usually, I mean, they don't have any genetic ties um, as the carrier and they don't have any legal ties. So as soon as the embryo is implanted, that is your child. Um, versus, you know, if it were traditional, it would be you anyways. And as soon as the child is born, you and your husband at the time um, would be you know, the parents on the birth certificate. But there are, so the legal documentation for that, the surrogacy side would be in advance. Right, and okay. it's very important to have lock solid um, surrogacy agreements for that reason. And I guess that's something you do. Sure, okay. yes. Talk with us just for a second about how foster care works from a kind of the legal side of it. Um, we all know people in our community, I have friends, uh, who have been foster parents before. Uh, uh, growing up, we had a foster child in our house for a period. There are legal rights um, that the biologic mother and father may still have, even though you have a foster child in your house. And then you could, there are actually circumstances where you can adopt a foster child and have a legal right to them at that time. To just kind of un un unwrap that for us and explain that to us, because that's a whole different area of the law. Sure, and that is, um, like I said, an area that is, um, at least in Jefferson County, on the rise is foster parent adoption, either adopting one or multiple children. Um, the birth parents would, um, or the biological parents, would still have to sign over written consent, um, and they oftentimes do. Um, but, you know, it's a joint decision with the foster parents um, and um, it's usually a lot less expensive um, and, you know, it, it is on the rise, so that's a great thing. Do foster children um, generally get into the foster system based on uh, something associated with a state agency like DHR or something else or do people just say, 
I cannot care for this child. I mean, how, how does that work? I, I've always wondered that. It's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, I do work in family court and a lot of kids that come into foster care um, through DHR is because they've been removed from the home for a variety of reasons, um, neglect and abandonment, um, you know, or issues with the parents having, you know, drug addictions or violence or that kind of thing. So um, unfortunately they come into the foster care system usually under some negative circumstances, but it can turn positive when the foster parents, you know, choose to adopt. I know we're going to break. Um, when we get back, let's talk about just some general questions that we, we have gotten related to this topic because I know there'll be plenty that um, uh, will address kind of these topics. Good. Uh, we'll step aside right there, coming up our final segment of the show. Uh, so just a few minutes remaining, if you'd like to join our conversation, uh, we'd love to have you do so. Also, those attorneys standing by live just for a few more minutes. So take advantage of that. Stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright. Now serving on a jury can be confusing because there's some information that the attorneys in the case aren't allowed to tell you. And in wrongful death cases, it might surprise you. In tonight's Legal 4-in-1, we're answering the question, what evidence is allowed in a wrongful death case? That's a case where one person's conduct caused the death of another. A wrongful death case is a civil cause of action for someone's death where money damages may be awarded, not jail time. In these cases, a lawyer can only talk about punishing and deterring the defendant for causing the death. That leaves out a lot of information about the person who died, including how that person's death has affected his family and his community. The reason lawyers only talk about punishing and deterring the defendant in these cases is this. In a death case, at the end of the trial, the judge will read a jury charge which says the following. The damages in this case are punitive and not compensatory. Punitive damages are awarded to preserve human life, to punish the defendant for its wrongful conduct, and to deter or discourage the defendant and others from doing the same or similar wrongs in the future. This means that in Alabama, lawyers cannot talk about how great the loss was to a person's family or friends for that death. They can't talk about lost wages or the financial impact on that person's family. Lawyers can't mention how much that person loved his wife, kids or grandkids, or what it would have meant to walk a daughter down the aisle, for example, in her wedding. In short, lawyers cannot talk about all the things that a person who died at the hands of another missed out on in his own life. In Alabama, the legislature said you can't put a value of someone's life so as lawyers, what we can do, the only thing we can do, is ask that the defendant is deterred and punished for the wrongful conduct that caused the death in the first place. We can ask that the jury send a message, a loud message, to prevent such types of death in the future. For example, if a truck driver caused a crash where someone died, the jury can send a message by making the truck driver pay money damages. The hope is that other drivers will be discouraged from the dangerous conduct that caused the death. As attorneys, we often wish we could submit more evidence to the court about the person who died, but unfortunately, we can't. If you were ever juror on such a case, please keep in mind what I've told you today about wrongful death cases. Remember, your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. A competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Welcome back. Our final segment this evening in tonight's show. So if you would like to take advantage of that opportunity to speak with an attorney standing by live, take advantage of that now, now just a few minutes remaining. A question we've got here about the time involved 
it does seem like a, a, a complex matter, but also something you don't want to rush into or through. So what's kind of the time frame that, that, that's average for the, this adoption process? Sure, so I tell most clients to expect a minimum of 18 months. Um, and I know that is a long time, yeah. and it may not be different than trying to have a child um, the traditional way because right. you may try for a while and then you still got the nine months. Um, but there just is a lot of time involved as far as going through the adoption agency, the matching process, um, the birth process. So. Um, you know, you have to be patient and that can be difficult because by the time you've made that decision, you're, you're ready to be parents. Yeah. But um, I always sort of emphasize that up front that this is a marathon, not mm -hmm. a sprint. So. so you see these people on television and celebrities and folks like that, that appear just one day, boom, we adopted another child. Right. That there has to be a much, th th this has been in the works for a long period of time. Yeah, I can think of one celebrity off the top of my head and, and I love her to death and she's been publicized a lot recently for having um, recently adopted and I think the article I read said she did it in five months and that may or may not be true but that's not um, the traditional uh, time frame. If somebody is interested in getting involved, because I know that uh, a lot of churches uh, and other organizations are uh, promoters of foster care and those types of things, what, what's a way for a parent, if they are interested in considering a foster child, to get involved in that? I mean, is it going through a church organization? Is it simply calling the state and saying, hey, I'd like to be put on a list as a foster parent? Because I can't imagine that every one of us has the ability just to be a foster parent overnight. You've got to be screened and evaluated and made sure that this is a good fit for both the, the foster parent as well as the child. How, how does that process work? Right, yeah, I mean, traditionally, you would just go through DHR um, and there would be a screening process and a home evaluation um, and background checks and, and a variety of um, steps to vet you to make sure that you'd be a suitable um, household for a child. Um, but there's also a lot of state agencies um, that handle adoption and foster care um, and just general. I mean, adoption.com is a great website that I use a lot. Um, just it has a million resources for mm -hmm. both attorneys and parents. I asked you off camera about uh, mentors. Um, because I know that we all in the legal world have used mentors over the years mm -hmm. to help us ascend to a higher level as a lawyer. I know you've got some mentors that, th this is one of those areas of the law where you almost have to have somebody that can kind of lead God and direct you through the process so that you learn it. Yeah, here in Jefferson County, um, there are a, really a handful of attorneys who years and years ago started doing adoption practice and have built their entire practice on that and have 30, 40 plus years under them. Um, and so I definitely go to them um, with any questions that I have. One of the things that I found interesting just getting prepared for the show is surrogate, uh, women that decide to be surrogates, uh, generally other than their costs associated with having a child are not necessarily compensated. Right. Most of the compensation is involved with their expenses for carrying the child. And like I said, that can range wildly. I mean, maternity clothes, medical bills, um, hospital visits, transportation, and then you have to think of when the birth happens, is it going to be natural? Is it going to be a cesarean? Yeah. Those costs can vary, um, but normally it's paid on a monthly allowance basis and it's arranged between the parents and the surrogate. We got a minute, a couple more yeah. questions real quick. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, if I'm a husband and wife, uh, I'm just not ready to go down the adoption route. Um, and I'm interested in a surrogate. Um, are there places, are there state agencies, are there ways to find surrogates or is it literally just word of mouth? 
how does that, I know that's kind of a weird question, but how does that work? Because some people want to have biologic children and need a surrogate to carry that child because they've had trouble having children. Right. Um, how, how do you find that person? There are surrogate agencies um, that you can research um, online and like I said, through a, an adoption agency may mm -hmm. kind of do a you know, dual um, duty of doing surrogate matches, um, but it also can be somebody that you know personally. That's interesting, because you think about that and you're like, you know, first of all, I think this area is fascinating, yeah. not just legally, but socially, mm -hmm. the way that we have the ability. I mean, you, you think about things like this as a lawyer and you realize that there's a whole legal side to this to make sure you've dotted the I's and crossed the T's to make sure you're totally protected if you're going to be the parent that has adopted this child or a surrogate. But there's a whole social side to this, too, which is a really amazing area. Uh, to look at. Yeah, we're, we're just about out of time and this has been a fascinating conversation. I can also tell you're really passionate about yeah. this, which is really neat. Uh, so for for our viewers, what, what sort of advice uh, or, or tips on this subject would you like to leave with them? I would just say, you know, um, really think about it, consider it. If, if something that's really near and dear to your heart, um, you know, do a little research, um, look into it. There's nothing wrong with asking some questions um, and just finding out what would be involved. Um, if you do decide to pursue it, like I said, be patient. Um, it can be a long and lengthy process and heartbreaking at times, but it's all in the pursuit of building a family, so right. it's worth it. Gosh, that's great. You. That's great. Um, you know, I'd say this: if there's somebody sitting on their couch today that has questions and wants to work through this, I know Kayla well enough to know that she's here to answer questions for you mm -hmm. um, and to help kind of lead, guide, and direct people through this process. Um, you know, I have personal friends. I know we probably all do that have adopted. And until I really got ready for the show, I didn't realize the work that was involved to actually go through that process. I just assumed you went to an adoption agency and it handled itself. Well, it doesn't really work that way. And if you find yourself in this circumstance and you're interested in surrogate, you know, being having a surrogate or through adoption, you know, Kayla's the type of person that you want to go to. And if you don't remember Kayla's name, call us. We'll get you to right. Kayla uh, to be able to answer questions. Because I do think it's super important to make sure that you are with somebody not only that is compassionate and also passionate about it, um, somebody that uh, understands the law and can really walk you through it to make sure that you're not making a mistake where in the 13th hour something goes totally different than you expected. Right. Um, so, first of all, thank you thank for you. not only being on the show, but being a part of this area of the practice because I think it's a very admirable area of the world. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very yeah, cool it's very stuff. fulfilling. Very well, cool. Well, thank you both for being with us. Thank Good to see you, you again, Kayla. Good to be back. Yeah, uh, we'll have to do it again. We thank you as well for being with us. As always, thanks so much for the time as we wrap things up here, how you can get in touch with the firm. We thank you again for being with us. We'll see you next time on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.